Could we have everyone please rise for the pledge? One, <clears throat> we do have uh, one change to the agenda. There will be an executive session uh, that will be added as item number 10. Uh, item 11 will, will be to come back from executive session and item 12 will be to adjourn the meeting. So we need a motion to approve the, the agenda with the following changes. Motion by Carrie, second by Barb. All in favor? I and Jess, do you want to either give a thumbs up or a, a yes? Yes. Just so we have it on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, motion carried. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome our newest board member, Jessica Krause, virtually to our first uh, meeting. It's good to have a full board again, so we're excited. We're gonna move right on to our recognitions and presentations, and we'll start with our capital project update with uh, Julian. Can everybody hear me here on the Zoom? Is it going through well? Okay. All right. All right, good evening, everybody. Here today to talk to you guys about the capital project for phase three. Um, we, we're just at the halfway point now. We've wrapped up phase 3.1 and 3.2, which was Vets Park. And I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the future work and phasing and the way that's going to be broken down for the, the future phases coming up here. So the first sub phase that we're going to be pursuing here is phase 3.3. The scope is centralized at Prospect Elementary. It includes the Prospect Elementary addition, which you can see the floor plan that Stieglitz has developed here. It also includes some renovation areas, which includes some classroom conversions in the pre-K wing, upgrading some bathrooms and adding some faculty bathrooms in within the existing building, and then some corridor finished improvements as well. And then lastly, uh, some scope that, that needed to happen there, the roofs were getting out of warranty. So all the roofs at, at the existing building are gonna be replaced within this, this sub phase. As far as the schedule is concerned for this, this phase, Stieglitz is just wrapping up the, the design um, right now, um, going into the month of October. So they'll be planning to submit to SED towards the end of October. With the SED review, that puts us in a bid period around late winter um, of 2021, rolling into the winter of 2022. And then with construction starting in the summer of 22, there's going to be a little bit of a delay from the bid opening period to the start of construction, just with the heavy demolition that's going to be involved with the addition here, as well as the thought of trying to give Gail and her students a little bit of reprieve from just wrapping up the phase two project as well. So that construction will start the, as soon as the kids get out in the summer of 2022 there. The next sub phase will be phase 3.4, which would wrap up the, the phase three referendum. The scope of work over here includes the Native American Services Suite renovation, which converts the current business office edition shown here in red into the Native American Services Suite. It also includes the district office edition, which is shown here, the, the big addition added off to the side of the current business, business office suite there. And then some of the blue areas here are all private offices that you can see here with some more collaborative space shown here in yellow on that floor plan. It also includes some facade upgrades, which kind of ties in the additions that have been added over the last few years here, as well as ties into this new addition here to kind of spruce up the front of the building along the bus loop and tie in um, some of the, the facade from this addition back to that steam addition that we put in years ago. 
And then lastly, we'll be doing the freight elevator replacement, which is getting outdated. Um, so that'll get replaced as part of this, this phase as well. The schedule for this is a little bit behind prospect right now. We're looking at an SED submission as design wraps up in the spring of 2022. That puts a bid period late summer, early fall of 2022, and then rolling right into construction right after we open bids in, in late fall of 2022. Uh, before I turn it over to Jeff for a little update on design and some of the concepts that they've been working on, does anybody have any questions? All right. Thank you, everybody. Here you go, Jeff. Yep. All right. Uh, I'm Jeff Klutzer from Stiglitz Snyder. Um, I'm going to uh, basically pick up where I left off on the last presentation. I won't repeat a lot of inf information from what I gave you guys in the August presentation. I'm just going to give you really the new stuff. Um, pretty exciting because we really got into the interiors since the last meeting. Um, and I think you'll like what you see today, hopefully. Um, primary tasks are pretty much the same right now. Uh, Julian gave me a good, gave a pretty good intro of what we're working on. Really prospect addition in the high school, high school admin are kind of our focus at the moment. Uh, we got a variety of tasks that we are working on. Uh, but those have been our focus. Um, we've started to give uh, the administration a monthly update on our design progress. So we're listing everything we think we're working on at the moment. Um, anything that's been asked of us, we're trying to keep it all on a single page cheat sheet. So everybody knows what the design team's up to and what we're working on. Um, doesn't show up in the presentation, but since the last meeting, uh, the prospect roof, uh, we got you know a lot of detail there. We had a roof consultant out do cores. Uh, we looked at all the equipment on the roof, trying to avoid change orders where you got to lift uh, equipment off the building. Um, you know, I want to go forward here. Yep, sorry. Uh, and, and put equipment back on the building. There's been increases in insulation values. So we've really Delia and our team has put put a ton of time into that roof since the last meeting to make sure that's designed correctly now that it's added into the project. Um, there won't be any pretty pictures of the roof, unfortunately, but um, we will get into the, the, in, the additions and the renovated areas here. Okay, so the existing floor plan, which we've been through, um, addition off the front of the building um, in line with the, the newer gym, the cafeteria, and then the addition fits in nicely there. Um, that's the zoomed in view of that. And really, if you remember, the addition really has the STEAM classroom, the Seneca cultural space, um, the um, interactive learning space, and then a, a, a support suite that takes offices that are all buried in classrooms now into a, a appropriate location and frees up classrooms for us. Um, this is not new, so this is our same elevation. Okay, so the addition is going to fit right in with the building. We'll be matching the brick. Okay, so now we're getting into some new stuff here. Um, what we did since the last meeting, um, we looked at all the interior finishes. We looked at some furnishings. We looked at some conceptual ideas of what the interior would look like for the pur purposeful play area, which is up here. Okay, so I, you, you enter the addition, this purposeful play area is opened uh, to the corridor. And then I have my steam room, Seneca room, and then the open office area, okay. We looked at a couple different concepts and ultimately, uh, based on decisions that have already been made in the building and the direction it was going with really the natural colors, the natural tones. Um, we thought that was definitely gonna be best. We looked at a couple of different options uh, with the staff um, and the administration. And this is kind of just some ideas of the color ranges that we're looking at. Um, then we started looking at uh, some conceptual rendering ideas and around the classrooms. Um, one idea that we started exploring is doing a band that might be a graphic band higher up in the room that would give us an opportunity to maybe showcase a graphic, whatever it might be, either nature related or related to the subject that would be in the room. And then from there, we looked at some different uh, possible bands that might work and what, what, what each of those bands might meet, mean to the room it would be in. And then we got into actual renderings of the spaces. So this is the purposeful play space. Um, this door here would be the door you'd enter to get in here. 
And then this is the it's pretty tall space because it has to match the rest of the building. Um, and then in here we have um, basically different activities. We're going to have the Lego wall and some of the things that the ad administration wants. We're also going to have um, the ability to maybe put on a little um, storytelling, um, all different activities. Um, and what we're seeing here is, is a mezzanine level where we're going to be able to have whiteboard underneath it. And the kids will have a lot of space to do different activities. This is new to us, purposeful play. Um, it's not completely new overall. Uh, the state education department is starting to get more guidance out on it, but this really hits a lot of the bases of what we want to be able to do, pull activities out and then let the kids, you know, experience that activity without, um, I'd say the traditional classroom experience. And we think that we're on the right path to make that happen with where our design is going right here. Um, this is our, our corridor that walks around uh, to the multiple classrooms. Again, we're still in the purposeful play area. Okay. Now we get into the student support space. And just to be clear on this, so what we're really doing here is right now we have a lot of reading, uh, math, maybe different interve inter intervention services throughout the building taking up classroom space. By designing a suite appropriately for, the, for those activities, we can free up classrooms. Um, so that's where this space comes into play. We have private spaces where you can work with a student. We have open spaces where we can work with a student. Um, we have technology driven spaces. And this really is meant to be a very flexible area where we can do almost any kind of intervention with a student. Okay, um, this gets into the Seneca, Seneca cultural space. Um, this is where we started out. Um, again, this band can be anything. Um, and ultimately we're gonna want input from the district on what it, that band that's, ends up being and what it might mean to the Seneca, Seneca cultural space. Um, we started to show glass cabinetry. If we had artifacts or we had anything that we thought would be nice to display, that, we'd be, that a teacher would interact with a student, it'd be nice to have something where when they come in, if they see something they're interested in, they can ask about it, um, you know, then pull it out and then be able to experience that with the teacher. Um, so this is an initial rendering of that space. Okay, lots of whiteboard space, um, lots of, you know, ex you know, the colors that we have throughout the rest of the, uh, the addition. This is looking out towards the parking loop. And then this is the steam room. Okay, so in, again, a similar space in terms of its form, but we can change things like the band and some of the colors. Um, but again, bring it together maybe with the carpeting. Uh, but we're starting to think about what the cabinetry and things like that might look in these space look like in these spaces. Um, and you can see even trying to relay to the staff exactly what they're going to get. Okay, these are cabinets and, and they're, they're actually whiteboard services, so you can write on them. And by doing the renderings, we're able to, there's, there won't be any surprises. You know, when this is built, everyone's going to know uh, what it's going to look like. And then uh, this is brand new, actually. Uh, the principal and her staff haven't seen this yet or the admin. This is something I, I literally put stuff in here from today. Um, we're starting to do the casework uh, for the spaces and we'll review this um, with the admin and the staff to make sure we have it all correct. And then they're gonna call out every piece of casework and what it means. Cause in a steam room, you got a lot of casework cause you got a lot of materials um, that you're gonna wanna interact with the students. Now we'll do the same for the Seneca room. So right now we have um, all the casework kind of outlined. And this is really in a, a condition now where we can present this to anybody. If there's other people outside the, dish, the, the admin, if there's stakeholders that you want us to involve, we're really in great shape now to be able to show the concept and get feedback from anybody that, that um, wants to provide feedback for the addition. Okay. Um, admin planning. Um, I'll just go into this. Uh, so this is the image you've seen before of the addition. Um, I'm just gonna note here because it's gonna come into play in a minute. Um, this is what we call the clear story element. So the roof pops up kind of in the middle where the main corridor is. And what we're trying to do is get natural light into the middle of the building and it'll show up in uh, a rendering coming up here. Okay, just uh, the only thing I wanna recap on the floor plan, Julian, thank you for kind of giving the quick overview. So the blue is the offices. The yellow is really the collaboration. The Native American services suite is up here. It actually goes all the way to this end now. Um, and I'm gonna show a graphic of that. That's why I wanna make sure everybody knows where that is. So that's the existing admin area now. Okay, so this is uh, our, we, we got a little feedback from admin on this, but this is our first go at the uh, Native American services suite. And we wanna be able to present this to their staff. 
and their coordinators so that they can give us feedback. But a conceptual idea where we went um, is that on the corridor side, um, so you can imagine some people might know where those staff bathrooms are over there. We lined the things um, that had to be private. Um, so we got a conference room. We have a collaborative office. Uh, this used to be where the safe was. Uh, so that safe would come out to make room for everybody. And down here we have the family services coordinator. And then really the goal is to have this as a really flexible space. Large tables where you can gather with a group of students that might have an activity, um, a countertop with upper cabinets where you can take materials out and, and interact with the students. And then here along the windows, this is all glass. Um, so where our students are interacting with us, tutoring stations uh, with reconfigurable uh, furniture. So we show six tables lined up. You could put three together, you could pull two apart. Um, there'll be a lot of flexibility for that. Um, video wall here if we had an activity where we wanted to watch something we'd be able to put it up for the, the team or the individual groups as they're getting tutoring in the space um we thought it would be nice to have a display here oh i'm gonna go back a display here that might have some impact on the students it's um one thought was a uh, current influential native american display where we'd have a display of different um people um, who are current and, and might have an impact on maybe students being able to see that and understand um, uh, some kind of relationship to the suite itself, the Native American Services Suite. Um, and then lastly, entry. We can enter from the high school and go in. We can enter from the admin and go in. There's a small lobby, and this is really the connection point between the high school and the admin. Um, so again, we're, we're excited about where it's going. Uh, we got to get some more feedback from the admin. They're just starting to see it too. Um, and then of course, from the people who are going to act, actually use the space, which is obviously very important to us to get their feedback and see if it's going to work and see if they have ideas that we should be incorporating. Okay, um, what we're seeing here, again, just like Prospect, we're doing renderings of the interiors to start to get a feel for what it might look like. Um, and these are early renderings, but this is the entrance into the addition. Right after you go past the uh, entrance or past the, uh, the greeter, this is where you would be. If you can imagine, if I go in that direction, I'm going to the Native American suite. If I go uh, services suite, if I go this way, I'm going into the, uh, the admin building. So again, a shared entrance, um, and then they're connected through the high school. We're doing things like looking at how to incorporate graphics of things that you've put in your st strategic plan. Um, and we know a lot of time went into it. Uh, they all have meaning. So we're trying to start to look at things like that, like might be interesting to see that right in the building. Okay, and then once you enter into the admin, um, this is that clear story that's on the top of the building. So that's bringing natural light right into the middle of the building. And then this is really the spine. On one side, we have um, PPS and curriculum. The other side of the spine, we have the superintendent, um, we have personnel, uh, human resources, and uh, finance. But really, this is what brings everybody together. And that's what is uh, why one of the reasons we want to do this clear story, bring that natural light in, and uh, encourage collaboration. And again, we're seeing some of those graphics of the strategic plan on some of the walls. And then here, just kind of seeing the impact of that clear story. It's uh, so again, it's just a series of windows along the roof line and it's bringing that natural light down in the space. Um, what we're seeing here is one of the collaborative conference rooms. So that's right off the, uh, the main space. Um, that can be closed up for a private meeting or it can be opened up where you can have a much bigger event. If you have more staff there, you can uh, rearrange the furniture and have a bigger group. Um, so those are things we're looking at. And we're just starting to get into like how to incorporate Again, we're, we're thinking about graphics and the design, how to have some indigenous elements in the design as well. Um, and we're trying to get into that right now. Um, these are early um, renderings for this piece of the project as we're not gonna be done until January um, with, with the admin, but this is where we're at in terms of our progress. Um, and most of this is, like I said, brand new. There's a, the admin has seen this, a uh, couple of these images, but these are hot off the press uh, from I think Friday. Um, and then lastly, I just left it in here, athletic fields. We don't really have much progress since last meeting. So what, what we showed you last time is kind of where we are at the moment, because I know we're thinking about different things with referendums. Um, 
This was the original plan. That's what we're working on with the track. Okay, we've been talking about softball up here now. So we got, we're looking at that as well. And then we had the couple images of uh, a Greer reuse um, option uh, last time as well. But again, that's kind of where we are at the moment. Okay, hopefully I didn't talk too fast. I, sometimes I wanna, I know you guys got a lot to talk about today. Um, any questions? I had a couple. Yep. Um, back to the prop. Yeah. Uh, no, those are, no, they're not. You know what? I, you're, you're absolutely correct. I did say that. I shouldn't have said carpet though. It's um, actually, it's LVT. Um, sorry about that. And I, you're, you're correct. So here, this, this brings it together better. Let me bring it from here first. So this is LVT, um, which is a colored, um, it's basically uh, for anybody who doesn't know, um, it's, it's what VCT used to be the standard kind of classroom uh, flooring. LVT is really a step up now. Um, and we would either, either use LVT or linoleum. Um, and that's what is here. And what I was trying to say, like this base color, the gray color um, or brownish gray color will be inside those rooms to bring it together. And then we'll have other highlight colors let me get to it here that you'll see. Like in here, we started to interject the red and a little, a couple other colors. So we're trying to look at different colors to bring in. Uh, but absolutely, you're right. I said carpet. I should have said LVT. Yep. Yeah, I was just concerned. Yeah. I, and crafts and who knows what. And absolutely. Yeah. We've, beneath them. we've gotten rid of carpet in most spaces. I think um, libraries are kind of standard still, some of the office type spaces. But yeah, and the classrooms, absolutely not. Yeah. Okay. I got ahead of myself. Oh, Any other questions? The only other comment I had was I really like the idea about the Native American suite in general, but I, I like the fact that you guys even mentioned about putting influential uh, indigenous folks on the wall in there even. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, no. Uh, you guys have any idea of any influential indigenous folks that you might put on the wall? Uh, I wish I knew. I wish I, 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 I should have been prepared for that. Uh, no, because, but we talked about it. Yeah. We will, when we do the rendering, we will have people on there though, that get some ideas that we came up with okay. and then see how it looks. What do you got, Mark? <laughs> uh, I like the humor, but seriously. Well, I think anything from the president to uh, any of our trying contemporary. Yeah, anything. Uh, we were well, thinking right, current. Right now, I mean, when we think of influential Native Americans right now, the, the first one that comes to my mind is Secretary Halland, first Native American uh, head of the Interior Department, you know, things like that. That's so, I mean, it's, you know, get the brainstorming now, but come up with some good ideas. I really like that, though. I think there's some current artists, too. We did do a quick search, and there are some uh, Native American artists who are really highly regarded, who are current as well, you know, featured in museums and stuff like that. So there, they, we could really mix it up and show something exciting there. Yeah spot yeah <laughs> anybody else there we good all right thank you thank you for having us again and we'll see you in a month or two again with our progress thank okay. you thank you thanks jeff yeah all right next oh, we're going go to take Dale's mic home. <laughs> uh next we have our mentoring program presentation Thank you. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce Karina Flagg. Um, she has been with us for about six to seven months right now as our mentoring program coordinator, um, as well as our educational consultant, Flip White, um, who has been a significant contributor to the program overall. I'll stand on the second. All right. Now I cannot swagwego. That means I'm thankful that all of you are well. That's our Seneca greeting. Um, to start this, um, I was asked to come in as a consultant and to sort of guide, to assist, to get a mentoring program started. Couple, couple things you should know. In Indian country right now, um, the feeling in, in general is that <clears throat> a lot of the fix, the fixes to a lot of the issues that's facing Indian country is to go back to the roots. 
go back to our beginnings. And I'm, I'm one of those advocates in that our societies a long time ago had, had what we needed um, to live a good life, if you want to say that. And so this is just a quick look at, but it's years, this is years of work. I want you to know that. And it comes from a document called The Great Law. We say, Guyana's Hekbulwa. And <clears throat> that is, some say a thousand, some say 2,000 years old. But I happen to be in my lifetime, and just, I've had the experiences and just a good fortune to be around a lot of our traditional leadership. And I've learned so much from them. And in one of these meetings, a lady by the name of Carol Jacobs, um, she's Cayuga from the Bear Clan, and she's a clan mother. And she's traveled to the United Nations. She's traveled internationally. She's an outspoken leader uh, for the Cayuga Nation and the Haudenosaunee in general. And she made that statement. It says, the Hoyane hold the people, the law, and the way of life in the palms of their hands. The Hoyane, is, it's a word for chiefs. But you'll see later in here at the bottom, it says, and it fit the program. One of the terms, phrases that people use when they talk about leadership, the Hoyane chiefs, is those who put the people on the right path. And if that isn't a great, great fit for a mentoring program, because that's what it's all about, trying to influence, trying to guide, trying to get people to make the right choices. So when I heard that, and it wasn't just me, there was a bunch of us, we were like, whoa, that's the basis, the foundation of the community. And what we did, we tried to make it sort of a, a, a contemporary look. So we used the Venn diagram to sort of illustrate the balance, the balance that's needed of these three components. Again, the people, the law, and the way of life, okay? And here's, we start with the people. Everything always revolves around the people, their condition, their health, everything about them, their family, their community, their influences. And our fundamental feeling, our fundamental statement from the great law is that we will never do harm to others. And when there's others, and I know this comes from a native perspective, that's all of humanity. That's every living spirit, every, every living entity in, in our world, in this creation, has a spirit. So we have to live and do no harm to others. We'll practice good relations. And I think that's just fundamental. It's the idea of getting along. It's sort of team building, a synergy, that kind of. And then we'll pr practice holistic well-being. And I think that's probably one of the greatest gifts that came from our old, ancient um, ancestors was that what's really important about every single person, it, it's again, your holistic, again, it's like your attitude, your emotional security, I mean, uh, your, your degree of maturity, um, your physicalness, how you take care of yourself, I'm not a great example of that. Um, and then the idea of spirituality. And when we talked about that, you'll see on the next slide when we talk about spirituality, it, it, that can get real personal. So we sort of converted that to your character. Okay, so again, your attitude, your emotions, your physical, and then your character is what's really important to, to monitor or take care of. And then you go over here, and this is really, um, again, I think it's one of the greatest little equations of life, um, is that for as long as the earth moves, and if that's not permanent, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but as for as long as the earth moves, we will not compromise our responsibility to the people, the earth, and the future. And in the traditional circles, that's how they make decisions. The chiefs, clan mothers, those title holders, whenever they have a decision, they have to first determine the impact of that decision on the people, the earth, and the future. And when you, if you apply that later and you think about it, it never misses. 
it, it's, it's just a foolproof <laughs> equation. And then our law, I like this word, it's a covenant. It's almost like it's a handshake. That's how it is. It's like when, when, when someone says, boom, and I'm going to do this, that's what happens. That's what has to happen. So it's a covenant. Covenant. It's a commitment to that. Our way of life, again, some people de, um, define culture as the beliefs, values, and habits. And I, I think I'm in agreement with that, those combinations. Again, it's like what we think about, what we value, and then our habits are, are what we do. And I think that's where cultures change. We have ceremony. We have that turtle rattle. I'll explain that in a little bit. We have uh, our longhouses. We have song, we have dance, all of those things. Each culture has all of this, but they express it in a different way. We all, you'll see when at the end of this, how all of the, this value system and everything is, you have it. Every single culture has it. And that's the beauty of this. And that as we grow the program, um, it'll apply to all students. Right now we're working in um, uh, young native uh, males right now. So you want to move that? So how does this all fit? And sort of we take that traditional thinking, very fundamental. How do we make this ACE mentoring program? Again, using the idea of good relations, adding a sense of belonging. People have to feel they belong. They're a part of any organization, a school, a community, anything. They have to have that. There's that holistic well-being. But what's really interesting about that at this point is it is about the individual, but it's about this group also. What is the holistic, or I'm sorry, the collective attitude of this group? That's really important. You know, what is the collective problem-solving skill of this group also? And compared to the individual. And again, us, um, are we able to endure? Are we able to handle those challenges that come before us? And then again, there's that spiritual and that's our, our character as a group. So it applies in both instances. And I think that's a real unique look at it and sort of an advantage of it. But again, it all starts with the people in this piece. I threw that in there because this is sort of, uh, not sort of, but the definition that we use under the great law of peace. It is about no war, getting along, that kind of thing. But it's also about your health. That's why we say nyawe is a way of saying thank you. And then we say nyawe scano, and that's a way of saying, I'm thankful that you're healthy. It's really important that we maintain that balance. So, and then if we come down to the law, you know, the three R's in school, was it reading, writing, and arithmetic? We've got a new one. Well, it's an old one, but it's sort of new. We believe the, the goal here in this, these laws is to be, always be respectful, to be responsible, and to be reasonable. That's a real, real big one. You have to maintain your sense of reasonability. Then we come over here again. Um, now, let me go up here first. The network, this organizational network, and this program has to have those good relations and has to have a strong organizational health or wellness. And that includes all of these. Whoop, what did I do? Innocent. There we go. All right. So, but it's parents, it's the mentees, it's the mentors, it's this district, the Board of Education, other Native programs, and the Seneca Nation Council. It's everybody has to be involved in this to make that meter move in the right direction. And we have to be, again, um, balanced, a, a really good, strong organization. Then going down here, the right environment in this case is that it's culturally centered. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the two-row wampum. Is that striped one? Well, one of those purple rows, it represents our way of life. And with this program, we're starting there. We fully believe that the identity of these young guys that we're working with 
is critical. They have to understand first who they are as Haudenosaunee. Later in life, they'll make their choices and whatever, and, and that's all good. But as a base, and again, coming from the idea of our, our, our societies and our culture had all of the answers, that's where it starts. But we're gonna follow that path and we're gonna make sure those kids know who they are. And then <clears throat> they also have to have in this environment, a sense of safety and security. If, if you're not safe, feeling safe in your environment, you'll, it's a struggle. And if you're not secure in that element, it's double jeopardy. And we have to work towards cooperation if we ever want any level of trust to develop, okay? So this is sort of a look at a traditional look, sort of a contemporary look and applying it to this ACE mentoring program. Now getting into it specifically, the results that we're looking for, and this is really important, the ACE stands for to be deemed an asset in your community. That's what we're working for. We want others to look at these people, these young men, and say, yeah, he's a good one. Yep, contributes. And that leads into the second one. C is to be a contributor. There are givers and there are takers, but we need more contributors right now. And to, 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 to contribute to your community, to, to build that community, to come home to that community, whatever that, that experience is. And the last one is to exemplify your best. Okay, it's your best version of you. That's what we're looking for. It's difficult, and this is a process. This isn't a no overnight kind of, kind of uh, adventure here. This is gonna take some time. But what's really interesting, I was sitting there listening and looking around, look at that. Some of the same elements are in that. That's how universal this approach is. But again, we go back to the idea of, we want our young men to know who they are first. So when they go out into the world, they can answer that. They can, they can be that, they present that. That's what we want them to be, to be confident, not cocky, but confident. We want them to be kind, helpful. We, we want that kind of behavior where we're opening doors for ladies again. You know, that's what we want. So I hope that makes sense to you. Are there real, any quick questions? I'm going to turn it over to Karina. Is this sort of understood? And Okay, great. Here you go. Oh God, technology. Look out, I'm gonna mess this up. Um, so this is why we are doing what we are doing. Uh, these, um, these are two narratives from two parents. So the first one says, I can see it's promise for my kids and I know it'll help to establish new community of supports, expand boundaries for amazing experiences, provide safe spaces for my kids to learn from community members and push to find success. And the second one says, I feel this investment in our youth will have a seven generational impact. So this is why Flip and I really took the time to, you know, kind of get our vision and see what, what do we want this program to do? What's the ultimate goal? You know, this report. Okay. Next slide. So how do we do this? By investing time in our youth. So the mentors are expected to spend about an hour per week per kid that they have, at least. Sometimes they do more, sometimes, you know, they might um, miss a week and, you know, double up on their hours. But so they do that to exemplify qualities that positively impact themselves, the community, and the future. So these are the tools we are using to help exemplify the mentees' qualities. You want to talk about? Yeah. Trade you again. <laughs> Um, change. We want improvement. We want to make, we want to influence. The only way that really happens, we can talk about it, but it's behavior. Everything is in, been, you know, in behavior. I've been on about 52 diets, you know, and I never changed my behavior. So I stay on a diet, you know, how many times have people quit cigarette smoking? Yeah, I quit smoking six times, you know, that kind of thing. 
it's all through behavior. When you make behavior change, the reality of what you're trying to do will happen. Engagement. These mentors have to listen. They have to create a relationship with these young men. They have to just like, it, it's all about uh, that, that relationship building. That has to take place. The idea of empowerment is that the mentors then have to provide the experiences, those ingredients that will make an impact on their lives. And we've got stories to tell you about what has happened already. And we've had some excellent, excellent results. Encouragement. The whole world should go positive right now. We need to turn, turn that over. Start positive. Be positive. Act positive. You know, we can all tear down. What's that old adage? One person with a hammer can tear down a house, but it takes a team of people to build a house. You know? Inclusion. Um, there's a real fine line between inclusive and inclusion. The, the inclusive is everyone involving everyone. In this inclusion, what we're talking about is that the mentor will do their best to share the decision making. Those mentees got to have their say. They got to have their input in there. So we'll make sure that that happens. Intentionality. Um, it's like what you do, teachers. Every day you come in here and you make sure every effort, everything that you're doing in a day is geared to make those students succeed. It's the same thing. The mentors have to prepare. They got to almost have like a lesson plan. There's a reporting procedure and everything so that we know how these young men are doing and what the mentor is doing. And there's again, a lot of great stories there, but that's just focusing every day. You can't waste time. We don't have time to waste, you know? We have those boys in front of us. And the last one is communication. I think that's up there too, right? Yeah, we communicate. There's just never enough. You guys, the school district, probably want more communication, more time, you know? It's the same way. If, if, if we communicate just once, we're failing. If we communicate three times, we're still failing. You have to get it to a point where there's understanding. So communication is real big. How that applies to those young men and those mentors, again, is they have to understand one another. They have to get that information to Karina. She's putting that in the reporting and everything like that. That's just fundamental. But it's the idea of parents talking with school administration, talking with those other native programs, any program, anyone that wants to offer help. We would like to, um, next year, we're looking down the road, we'd like to be a part of the orientation so that new teachers coming in, understand this, they see this. We want to we, we wanna advocate this program, you know, very strongly. So back to you, my dear. Or I'll be your lovely assistant. <laughs> um, so the goal is the mentee's behavior will manifest into future mentor behavior, which leads us to our ultimate goal, the mentees will be able to return as mentors one day. So, okay, so phase one of the program, mentees were referred by their family school liaisons. I have a referral form. I've been working really closely with them and they've been helping me out a lot with checking in with parents and just kind of helping me build that relationship with them. Phase two, mentees will be referred by school counselors. We're kind of getting there already. Um, I had two refer today, so right now I have seven students total. The goal by the end of um, the year would be to have 20. Next. So mentors were chosen based off the content of their character. And what we did, there was four of us. We gathered around a table and just started naming off names of people who we thought are pillars of the community. And we reached out and, you know, the work never stops with finding mentors. That's that's one of the challenges that I've had is finding mentors, but lots of great community members. We have, um, oh my God. you ready? Yeah. We got, this is probably <laughs> the most dynamic part. We got Brett Maybe, radio personality, really outgoing. Who, you know, what young person doesn't like music? The guy worked in the radio industry. He has a nationally syndicated show now. We got Dennis Bowen, former president of the United States. Um, I was going to say United Nations, the Seneca Nation, 
Um, he has spent probably 35 to 40 years doing work with youth um, after his political career. If you know Dennis, uh, he's a gentle giant. And he, he, he brings with him also um, the culture of the Navajo. His wife is Navajo. So it, 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 it's an amazing conversation when you sit and talk with those two. And I think that he'll be just incredible. We have a young man, um, Hills, Johnny John. He's like a cultural icon, you know, this young one, you know, he's a singer and a dancer and everything, but he's, he too right now, you, if you get to know him and you, you look at him, he's taken control of his life. He's taken control of his family. He's a dad now. Always, he's working hard. I think he's got two jobs actually right now. He's working real, real hard and he's real, he wants to take care of his son and everything. And I think he's a, an, another great one. We have Dallas Hogue. I don't know if you people know Dallas Hogue. He has this, I can't even explain it. You tell him about Dallas's house. Oh my gosh. It looks like a comic book store. It's full of board games, you know, full, full of everything, everything that you can think of. He has thousands of games. His collection is amazing. And they're different. I don't know where he gets these games. I mean, there's Monopoly and whatever, but there's a, all kinds of other games. And what's happening, he has, is having such success. He started with a mentee and all of a sudden that network is just growing. And there's other people say, man, that's really cool what they do. And what we try to provide with all these, the, the mentors and everything is, is we didn't want them to sit down and talk to them. We wanted them go do something. And while you're doing that, share whatever that message is at that time. And it's working. We have a partnership with uh, the con conservation department. Everything, fishing, archery, boating, canoeing, just they got it all down there. And they're actually building a cabin where all the crafts can be made and everything like that. So it's like, it's ideal. But uh, we, ha we have a, a really good pool. Who do I leave out? Caleb. Caleb. You guys remember Caleb? Abrams. Caleb Abrams, award-winning film filmmaker now internationally and he did the thing about kenzua he might be just the guy to lead this project and say let's put this project on on video let's tape it he just might be that guy and he's got all the skills all the experience uh, sort of the reputation he's what he's doing is incredible and boy i think that's just something great that again young people are interested in that technology that video and everything like that so and that's just some of them, but we have a really dynamic group and we're really proud of that. And it, it comes from the, sitting around the table one day and said, who is this? Who should we get? It's like, boom, boom, boom. And they're responding. Oh my goodness. All right, so should we move on here? Yeah. Okay, I got talking again. <laughs> so <laughs> this is how I match them. I match them on paper first. Um, and then after they're matched, I coordinate a meeting with the parent, the student and their mentor. And I just sit with them for an hour and just make sure that the matches, that it's going to work, make sure that they can, you know, that they kind of click. So it's worked so far. And I think it's really important to get the parents involved too. And that's a really good way to kind of start out on a good foot. Uh, this is uh, a good example of a collaboration. It's a great example of our cultural thinking. Um, you see that representation. And I'm sure most of you from around the area have seen a turtle rattle that we use and we use it, you know, in a longhouse and for dancing. Then there's a Osoekowa, which is a great feather dance. There are people who said I shouldn't present this and show it to people, but I, I, I do. <laughs> I guess I'm going against the grain, but it's, it's, it is the basis of our world. And you can see in here, there's 13 plates on the back of the snapping turtle. That's our calendar. And there's much more to, to what each one represents. And then these platelets going around here, there's 28 of them. And that's, our, that's that month. So we have 13 months, 28 days each. That's our cycle. But again, we use it as a representation of everything. And if you look here, and I mentioned a collaboration, what, what is really, really good about this is that this school is using this now. You know, it's in place. And this program that we're bringing along that's evolving 
just supports all of this. Again, it's in Seneca, but again, helping. That, that's fundamental to our societies. And same thing again on that banner. The idea of responsibility, taking care of self, that's that holistic. We have to know our song. We have to know our language. We have to know that because that's the only way we can use it properly. Okay? Giving thanks, gononio, encouragement, truth, truth, strength, love, gnongwa, respect, all of these things that we had there. That's all there. It's on the back of that turtle. It's our world. And again, if this were able to lay down, you would stand on it. And that would be Mother Earth. And in there again is its entire being. Do you guys know the story about the creation? I'm sorry, I'm back for turtle and that whole thing. Okay. We'll have to tell you a real deep one one time. It takes about three, good three hours to tell you. There's a lot more to it than it. there was a hole, she fell, she landed on a the turtle. There's a whole lot, a lot of meaning. So what are, where are we at here? That's it. That's is that end. it? Mm -hmm. Now, can I jump in a little bit? I get excited about this. I want to talk about her. <laughs> you chose a good one. Here's what many discussions. Um, this was rolled out in late spring. And then we had, you know, COVID. Yeah. End of the school year. School was up and down and all over the place. Tried to fit five, I think, five sports into one season had this new beautiful facility. So we struggled in the beginning because the students were just occupied elsewhere. But it gave us a lot of time to really think about this. And I didn't know Karina until we start working on this project together. Um, but she's very creative. She is very committed. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she was in the hospital about two weeks ago, a week ago or so, and she's still a little hurting but she's there, um, she participates. She goes to some of these sessions herself with the mentor. She picks up the mentees, make sure that they get there. One of the best things that she did was she, we kept looking at the program. We wanna say, how do we make it better? How do we make it better? And I think all of you would agree that one of the biggest pieces missing, and it's not an all or none, but there's sort of that reputation the, the parents aren't in the game all the time that's what she's doing she went to their homes it wasn't just a call hey we got a new program what do you think she went there and then we talked one day and we said let's take it to another level so she's calling parents now and the first meeting is dinner on her <laughs> and she's saying let's sit down and talk about this and there's the, the student the parent her, the program, everything like that. And I think that it's just awesome. Just so awesome that she did that. And she just keeps, I don't know, she has a great sense of uh, her energy. Her energy is endless. The people in the community love her and they're listening to her. And we're getting great feedback from the parents, those that are involved. School's now started, so the numbers are gonna increase. We're gonna to have to get more mentors and stuff and continue developing. And I think one of the, I hope I can say this right, but we haven't had uh, the experience of, oh, they shouldn't have done that. We, we haven't had that, it's worked. So I would credit her again with her training and the rollout and the understanding that of what they have to do. And we all get certified as mentors through New York State, right? Yeah, so there's a sort of covering all the bases, okay? And she's doing a great job. I love working with her. <laughs> so. Thank you, that was a really great presentation. And uh, it's exciting to see the work that you're doing. So congratulations to both of you. We appreciate it.
Next, we'll move on to our school safety and reopening, which probably won't be as exciting as what we It will be said. nowhere near as exciting. <laughs> um, so today is the 13th day of school for the 21-22 school year. Um, we are continuing to monitor the active cases of COVID so that we can respond appropriately. There's been a general decline in active COVID cases over the past week to 10 days, um, but we are still at levels that are concerning in our immediate region. We currently have a large number of students that are quarantined at home, as well as staff members. Um, while our staff has adapted very well to the ongoing changes, these are some significant stresses. And I wanna take another moment to just acknowledge the great work that our staff has done um, and continues to demonstrate um, as we sort of get back into the swing of things with um, students on campus um, and then having to make shifts and changes as new regulations come down, as well as new challenges um, with students who are quarantined, um, as well as staff members. So thank you. Our protocols and practices really have not changed since uh, the opening of school, but just a reminder for any of our staff members, it really is very simple. Um, if you have a question or a concern regarding quarantining, illness, anything COVID related, it really boils down to call Ray Haley. He is sort of the one-stop shop with um, coordinating HR for time off if necessary, assisting with getting tested, reporting to the county. Um, his daily routine typically is, you know, uh, has the majority of it spent dealing with um, ongoing COVID cases. So, um, but we're back. Students are in school. Sporting events are happening, um, and uh, it's just great to see our students back on campus. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Then we'll move on to communications. Do we have anyone from Title VI? Okay. All right. Then do we have anyone? Let me oh, go ahead, Gary. Okay. Title VI, though. Uh, we do have elections going on tomorrow for the, the parent committee, and um, that'll be going on all day long at the uh, administration building, the Senate Canadian administration building, and then also at Vets Park. So we're getting new, uh, hopefully getting new officers on the Title VI Parent Committee. Thank you. We'll move on to central office message. Uh, Ms. McGarra is not with us tonight. So we'll move on to Dr. Beeler. Ah, thank you very much. Um, again, just wanna say thank you to the hard work um, and welcome some of the new staff members that we anticipate appointing tonight. <coughs> I anticipate that Mr. Bridenstine has um, some information regarding the most recent incidents and I don't want to uh, be a spoiler for that. So I'll, uh, I'll end my remarks here and let uh, him continue. All right, thank you. So we'll move on to the board message. Let's start with Dale. Good night, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Brad? Congratulations to all the sports teams that were victorious since the last meeting. And I just wanted to mention something based on the recent events as far as community involvement and encouraging the community to reach out to any board members if they see or hear anything suspicious, even though this one was not deemed the threat that we thought it was. I'm sure there's other stuff out there. And that's all I got. Sue? We're interested in hearing from our superintendent. Barb? I'd like to welcome Jessica again to the Board of Education and all new staff members. I wish everyone a safe and great school year. And I was... Um, interested to see the purposeful play area in the presentation. I had the opportunity to visit Lisa's classroom when they were doing that program. And I think it's very beneficial for children. So good to see. Jess, do you have anything that you wanna add? Just wanna say hello and I hope everybody stays safe and healthy. And uh, I look forward to learning a lot more and uh, thank you for for uh, 
we can should be able to hear you. Okay, I just yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I just wanted to say hello and uh, I hope everybody stays safe and healthy. And I look forward to learning a lot from you all. And uh, thank you for your support. <coughs> Thanks, Jess. Carrie? I just wanted to say welcome to Jess as well. I'm glad you've, uh, you're aboard and looking forward to working with you. Um, Honestly, I don't have too much to say tonight. Other than those are a couple of good presentations we saw. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation that Karina and Flip put on. Um, that's it. Okay. I'd also like to again say welcome aboard, Jess. I'm excited uh, that you've joined the board. Again, it is good to have a, a full board again. So uh, we look forward to teaching you our secret ways. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, I would uh, also encourage anyone if they do ever have any concerns about the school, you can reach out to any of the board members. We are online. We do get check our emails. And uh, if you don't feel comfortable reaching out to us, make sure you reach out to an administrator, a teacher, any, anyone in the school district, they're more than welcome to help you out and can guide you in the right direction to make sure that uh, if you do have concerns that they're heard and that we can help address and take care of any situation. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Bob, Super Bob. Thank you. Um, so first, uh, greetings and my apologies for not being at the meeting in person. Uh, I just landed uh, a few minutes ago from a return trip from Washington, D.C at the National Association of Federally Impacted Schools where uh, I was presenting on our family liaison program. And before I dive into the events of uh, late Sunday and Monday, uh, just a couple of quick comments uh, about the trip and the importance of going down to Washington, DC. And while the lobbying portion of the trip was relatively small and uh, tightly knit, um, the importance of having the district represent uh, Salamanca in Washington, D.C., where these uh, events happen. Uh, as Alexander Hamilton said, you need to be in the room where things happen. And being down to D.C. Um, is something that really helps to put Salamanca front and center, both on a New York State indigenous platform. We were one of only three school districts from uh, approximately 40 that went down uh, and participated either virtually or in person. Uh, it's important to be there to advocate for the impacted schools across the country. It's important to represent Salamanca. And I had the opportunity to present on our family liaison program and talk with many school districts uh, and tribal entities from across the country and from just about all 50 states we're able to participate in some way, shape, or form. So that's an important part of what we do and an important board goal of celebrating the success that we have found in Salamanca by engaging our families, listening to our community, and making good decisions that help uh, all of our students and their families. And that really kind of takes me as a segue to the events of a very late Sunday evening. And so uh, just on a personal note, um, I, I think I need to pass the uh, traveling to Washington DC trip to Mark. This is the third time I've been in DC where I've had to close schools, twice for weather and once for the events of Sunday. And it's really important to note, I think, that when you receive a phone call late into the night from the police department as a superintendent, there are very few times where that's a good call. Um, and Sunday was certainly one of those instances where it was not a good call. At 8.45, when I received the phone call from the Salamanca police, literally my heart dropped. Um, and um, my first instinct was uh, what would normally happen. Okay, take a deep breath. Let's get all the facts. And at that time at 8.45, we were sh short on facts. We knew that multiple students had made a threat. 
we weren't sure who all of the intended targets were or even what the target was. There was great uncertainty as to the events that transpired that had been happening for several hours before I received the call. After maybe a 25 minute phone call, um, I ended with the Salamanca Police Department and my first phone calls um, were to my administrative team, to Dr. Beeler, to Mr. Siebert, to Mr. Haley, and to the SROs. And if you can imagine nine o'clock on a Sunday after a, a great Bills victory, um, it, it took me a few minutes to connect with the entire team. But within seconds of connecting with them, we had a command center going across multiple states and we were getting to the bottom of what we needed to do immediately. And I will tell you, I instantly knew that I thought it was going to be a very, very long night. I, I wasn't sure how long, but I, we've been here before and school leaders are often here before. And it was important that we got more facts, that we divided up the responsibilities. We had task responsibilities from an incident command structure. And I will tell you, I, we couldn't have done what we did in the time frame that we needed to do it if it wasn't for the work of our three SROs, uh, Ronnie Smith in particular, Matt Deboy and Steve Dombeck, Ray Haley, Chris Siebert, uh, Mark Beeler, and other administrators who were standing by, whether they were on the call because it directly impacted their buildings or standing in the wing saying, tell me what you need me to do, we'll get it done. And this is late into the evening. And finally at about 11 p.m. in a conference call, again with the Salamanca Police Department, Dr. Beeler and myself, I made the decision to close school. And we have stated from the pandemic forward and even before the pandemic, our priority is to teach and create a learning environment and to keep people safe and to keep people informed and to communicate. I wasn't sure at 11 p.m. that I could keep people safe. And it wasn't that I would be on the ground or administrators would be doing law enforcement, but we have an obligation as a district to make sure that everyone is as safe as we can make them. And at 11 p.m., when three of the four alleged students were still unaccounted for, and there wasn't certainty if a gun was or was not involved, and we had parents who were uncooperative with law enforcement, the decision to close was easy, but it was still gut-wrenching because closing is easy. Putting things back together and making sure everyone felt safe is a challenge. But in Salamanca, I knew we were in good hands. Chris Siebert, Lynn McGarra, Bob Finch in transportation, Karen McGarra in the business office, Mark Beeler, Ray Haley, our SROs, our administrators at the elementary and intermediate schools, we're ready to take action and make sure that we were safe. It wasn't until approximately 8 a.m. on Monday morning that we knew that the students were accounted for, that we knew that it was not a gun being brought into school, and in fact, that the school was not even targeted, that that was not accurate as originally reported. And experientially, social media doesn't help these things. And there were old posts that resurfaced and rumors that continued to swirl. I do want to commend the community, however. They kept it tight. They kept it um, very secure. They didn't blow up the internet with all kinds of wild accusations or innuendos or things that they heard from someone who heard something. Um, the community took this with the level of seriousness that it was. And from 8.45 until about 7.30 in the morning, we were still at the equivalent of DEF CON 1 for safety and security. Now, working through on Monday, again with uh, law enforcement and school personnel, we came away with some things that I think are really important. And when you have a crisis, making sure that everyone is safe, making sure that everyone knows what their responsibility is, does really follow the incident command structure quite well. But then what happens afterward is as equally important, but oftentimes doesn't get the notoriety or the publicity. And that's the debriefing that occurs. And we've walked away from this with a couple of things that, that I, I want to acknowledge. One, we have students 
in our community who are in deep peril with law enforcement and making good choices from a legal perspective. And that filters into school. None of this happened in school, but it involved everyone that comes into school. And there's a legal threshold that I meet when I have to determine with the building administrator if something needs to happen to those students from a disciplinary consequence. And we took that measure and we based that on the facts. And that's been handled. But we still have other students who've now reported to us that this has been ongoing in the community and we need to pool our resources with the Seneca Nation, with the city of Salamanca to make sure those students both the victims of this kind of behavior or threats or the perpetrators or alleged perpetrators of these actions and the law enforcement system will ferret that out, make sure that everyone gets the help and the attention that they need, but never at a point where we can compromise students or families safety. The other part too that we came away from this is no matter how well we think we did, we can still do better. And we reached out to the city of Salamanca, both the mayor and to council members and to the chief of police on several occasions and said, we are here to help. Never again should it take the SPD or the county four or five or six hours to determine who students are based on a video surveillance. We can help them identify students in crisis. We can help them identify students who have uh, a need for our assistance and that we have deep relationships with these families. We can have conversations with families that police and law enforcement can't have about public safety. That's a big takeaway from this. We can also take away from this that when there is a crisis, it's not about ego, it's not about territory, it's not about um, who gets credit, it's making sure that everyone is safe. And I, I'm awfully proud of the interagency collaboration between the SPD, the Cat County Sheriff's Department, the school district and the Seneca Nation. And when we called or they called, we just made things happen that kept everyone safer. And I wanna end with kind of this conversation. And I know that tomorrow the district safety committee uh, is meeting to talk about some of these issues. And part of my request is, is what we've learned from this. And this incident didn't just materialize on Sunday. There were precursors that were happening in the community that we've now come uh, to a better understanding about the um, trigger events that created this dynamic happening as early as the middle of last week between students. And there were several competing things happening in the community with students that materialized on Sunday. And I'm gonna ask the community for their assistance uh, when these things happen. If your child comes home and tells you that something is happening, please listen. And I think our parents do a great job of doing that. But please take that to the next step. We have a robust level of school counselors, family liaisons, school social workers, uh, we have nurses, we have administrators, we have all manner of personnel. And having come from the airport in Washington, D.C., I think it's important to note when we see something, we should say something. Because it, what may seem seemingly insignificant, when you start to put multiple pieces together of the dynamics that families and communities are going through, um, it paints a different picture than a single isolated incident. And we can mobilize and materialize our supports sooner, earlier, and faster so we never get to the point again where we have a threat that we can't verify and community and family members scared. And that's my most current pressing issue is that we still have families in crisis from this. We have the families of the students that allegedly made these threats that they are in crisis. We have families that were targeted that still will be in crisis. And we know from our work with trauma-informed care and restorative justice practices with our students that historical trauma is something that you carry with you for a long time. And we can learn from this, make ourselves safer, and also make ourselves and our community more well when we continue to collaborate. The district can be awfully proud 
the community, the police departments, law enforcement agencies, the Seneca Nation, and everyone involved can be awfully proud of the fact that we made sure that we were safe and at least as safe as we can be. Um, I'm going to stop here if there's any, I have a few other things to add, and I know that was a little bit longer than I had uh, planned, but I'm going to stop here and if there's any other questions about the events of Sunday and Monday. Any questions? No questions, but I, I fully supported our decision and backed you 100% on closing <clears throat> school for Monday. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Carrie. Okay, hearing none, I've got a couple of other things uh, that I want to say. And one is uh, I am just want to let the board members know if you hadn't seen your emails, but uh, the New York State School Board convention in New York City uh, next month was canceled. There is a, a virtual event of the keynote speakers. We did have two uh, presentations, uh, one from Mrs. Dudek and Mr. Parisi. Uh, about uh, pupil services, and the other was our student advocacy group on the uh, journey that they took in convincing the school board uh, about raising the progressive pride flag and getting a new flagpole dedicated to that important student-centered mission. Um, we'll talk and look at the schedule and get them on a board agenda to kind of give us the um, the, their presentation in New York City was 90 minutes. Uh, we'll ask them to come at a later date, probably in November, and talk to us about the, the presentations that they were going to do. Um, and then the last piece that I, I wanted to note for the school board members was regarding uh, something that Dr. Beeler had noted briefly about a reopening plan. Uh, and I, I do want to comment on the immunization slash vaccination piece as it relates to staff. Uh, board members, you know that I've been updating you regularly on staff members who have identified themselves as being vaccinated or those who have said that they are opting out as required by the most recent New York State um, Department of Health and executive orders from the governor. Um, I'm, I'm uh, pleased to report that those numbers are starting to shift with individuals choosing to tell us what their status is and uh, letting us know that um, more individuals have reported their vaccinations than we were approximately two weeks ago when this first emerged, now approaching three works, weeks now that I think about it. Uh, at that time, three weeks ago, we had about 130 staff members vaccinated um, out of approximately 400, and that 400 number includes everyone, even spring coaches from last year that are still on the books, um, substitutes who may not be subbing with us, it's everyone. So the number of 400 is probably closer to 350, actually, and our number of um, uh, individuals who've identified that they are vaccinated is uh, close to 270. So we've made a significant progress on that realm. And it obviously is the individual's decision at this point in time. We have not yet begun uh, weekly testing. They are still working on that protocol from the county. We continue to remind people that um, we'd like them to let us know what their status is or be prepared to submit for weekly testing as ordered. I'm not aware of any district in Cat County or Allegheny County who has started the mandatory uh, weekly uh, testing, um, but we are continuing to work on that. We did have a meeting last week, Friday, um, where we continue to talk about those dynamics, the uh, inability uh, of the county to get tests and the fact that the EMTs who were previously doing mobile testing units, um, that legislation lapsed September 1st. Um, and so the EMTs were not in a position to continue to test by state law where previously they were able to. So there is a lot of moving, there are a lot of moving parts with the vaccination immunization order. And um, I'll let the political pundits comment on uh, whether or not that is good public policy or not. But I will just simply state that we will comply with public policy. Uh, it's what we do. It's the role that we take in being models for students. Um, we will follow the regulations. And when we 
have concerns, we will vocalize those concerns and advocate to make things change to make them better for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Does anyone have any other questions for Bob? All right. I, <clears throat> excuse me. Who pays for the testing if you opt out of the uh, shop? That's a really good question, Sue. Um, superintendents met about a month and a half ago when the federal money was allocated to New York State and then Cat County received their allocation. We were under the distinct impression, all 22 of us, that the county would be covering the costs of all of the tests. I'm not sure if that's still the standard um, that is going to be used. It's still evolving. Do we have any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to the consent agenda. So we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Barb, second by Sue. Are there any questions on any of the items? All in favor? Aye. Thumbs up from Jess. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. We have no old business. Our new business item A is our change orders. So we need a motion to approve uh, the two chain, two or three change orders above two. <laughs> motion by Dale, second by Brad. Are there any questions on the change orders? All in favor? Aye. Thumbs up from Jess. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item B is our contract for every person influences children. So we need a motion to approve that contract. Motion by Sue, second by Dale. Mark, would you like to give us a brief rundown, please? I would love to. <laughs> um, so every person influences children um, is commonly referred to EPIC. It's an organization with its uh, headquarters located in Buffalo, which is fortunate for us. They have a mission of helping families, schools, and communities raise children to become responsible and successful adults. Uh, the proposal before you is to open an EPIC support center with Salamanca schools in Salamanca and provide a full-time family engagement manager and trainer and a full-time family engagement coordinator. In addition, the uh, EPIC's director of family engagement um, will provide training and team building for all of our family support workers. Um, and that training is important because we've just added five new um, family support workers over the past month. Um, some of them have a wide range of experience um, in this particular field and particularly in the environment we're in right now. But EPIC has a pretty significant presence here. And some of the topics that our um, individuals will be trained on is things like understanding poverty mindset, differentiated family engagement, raising resilience, communication skills for challenging conversations, and conflict um, management. So all of our family support workers will receive a baseline of training um, from people who are professionals in this who and have developed an actual curriculum that they use across New York State. Um, they, in addition to that, they're also going to be providing programming for our students, um, our staff, as well as for the community. Uh, topics such as um, preschool basic reading, um, a Just For Me program, which is, helps students in middle school with life skills, uh, programming called Just For Teens, which is for pregnant and parenting teens, um, tech savvy. So they assist parents um, with things ranging from online safety to how to um, assist with uh, homework online. Um, and then Ready, Sit, Read, which is a big one that is utilized with um, students prior to school, so our pre-K students, um, and even earlier than that. Um, in summary, the total cost is completely provided and written into the American Recovery Program grant, so it's covered through the ARP grant, um, and it'll provide our students and our grown-ups with a wide range of skills from reading to young children to parenting skills, as well as the tech skills that are necessary. Completely aligns with our district mission, as well as our Title I requirements. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, getting them on board as soon as possible. Do we have any other questions or comments? Yeah, 
have a motion by Sue, second by Dale. All in favor? Aye. Thumbs up from Jess. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item C, uh, we need a motion to create six full-time uh, permanent building substitutes and one full-time account clerk typist effective September 22nd, 2021. Motion by Barb. Second by Brad. Are there any questions on any of the positions? All in favor? Aye. Thumbs up from Jess. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item D is our substitute bus driver. Uh, the rate will change from $15.50 to $17 an hour. Substitute retired bus drivers will change from $18 an hour to $23 an hour. We need a motion to approve those rate changes. Motion by Sue. Second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Thumbs up by Jess. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item E is our adult education program for the fall of 2021. So we need a motion to approve the uh, program course offerings. Motion by Barb, second by Brad. Are there any questions on uh, adult ed? All in favor? Aye. Thumbs up by Jess. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item F are items that are be being declared surplus. Uh, so we have a couple study sync reading and writing companion, about 148 books. And then another sync uh, reading and writing emotional current 64 books. So we need a motion to declare them surplus. Motion by Dale. Second by Carrie. Do we have any questions on any of these books? All in favor? Aye. Thumbs up by Jess. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item eight is our personnel consent agenda. So we need a motion to approve uh, our personnel consent agenda. Motion by Dale. Second by Sue. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Oops, thumbs up by Jess. Sorry, Jess. So all in favor, no opposed, motion carried. We have our personnel action number two. So we need a motion to approve personnel action number two. Motion by Barb. Second by Brad. All in favor? Thumbs up by Jess. I will abstain. Motion carried. And item E is our confidential managerial contract. We need a motion to approve um, the contract from September 27th through June 30th of 2024 for Marilyn Reeves. Motion by Barb, second by Carrie. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Thumbs up by Jess. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And now let's yes, introduce some people. I'm going to ask uh, Mrs. Dudek to introduce our um, new warrior, Marilyn Reeves. Oh. All right, thank you everyone. I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone that took part in the interview process. Um, the process included a wide pool of applicants and Mary Lynn made it down to our final two out of 27. So um, the process, Dr. <laughs> no pressure at all. Dr. Simbritz and Mr. Parisi, um, Nancy Williams from The Nation and Mr. Breidenstein all took part in part of the interviews along with Josie Hubbard. And I can't say enough about Mary Lynn. She comes with a wealth of knowledge. She has been a confidential secretary in a previous district and understands the financial aspects, which will help tremendously with the data and with the grants moving forward. But we're excited to have her as part of our team and excited to have her become a warrior with us tonight. 
So thank you, Mary Lynn, for jumping in and, and being with us starting on the 27th. Uh, and I believe that is all of our new appointees that are here this evening. Yes, thank you. Item nine is our board information and reports. Um, so we'll just skip on. We have first readings of quite a few different policies. Please make sure you read them. And if there's any changes, uh, mark them down, get back to Bob and Karen and Mark so that they know what they are. Our upcoming events, September 22nd is the district safety meeting. Uh, and you said it's also the election for Title VI, Carrie, correct? And Title VI, is it, the, is it at the SAB? Being held at the uh, administration building and also at Vets Park. Okay. So please go and vote. Um, and then September 30th will be our personnel committee meeting. And then we have open house also on September 30th from 5 to 630. Uh, October 5th will be our next board of education meeting. So uh, Janet had mentioned that our NISBA convention is canceled. Uh, so all board members be aware of that. Our next uh, tentative board retreat will be November 9th. So if you can't make it, please let us know so we can reschedule if too many of us can't make it. And with that, uh, we need a motion to go into executive session uh, for the purpose of property acquisition. Motion by Sue, second by Carrie. All in favor, aye. Thumbs up by Jess, opposed, motion carried. Thank you everybody for coming. We will not have any action coming out of the meeting. So there is no need to stick around unless you really want to just hear us come out and adjourn. <laughs> but thank you for attending. Mark, do you want to just call me from um, the library or have me stay on?